Welcome to part two of this four-part series of Battle Tactics in Rule the Waves 2. We're going to look at 12 tactics around ship maneuvering. It's actually ship or division or squadron who all follow the same commands as a ship, uh, as opposed to fleet where you've got multiple squadrons or divisions to consider. They split quite nicely into thoughts about range and thoughts about how to shoot better. Let's crack on. So range, I had thought of splitting this out into its uh, four component parts, but it's actually easier to think about these four all together at the same time, but I'm aware that might be a little bit overwhelming. So let me break this down for you. First of all, let's change this highlight into a spotlight. There we go. So first of all, I want to emphasize that fundamentally what I'm asking you to do, and I when I say you, I also mean me, is think about range very, very consciously. Not just as I tend to do it roughly, impressionistically, but in a much more deliberate way. There is a lot of control that you can have over the success of your ship or, or squadron and the vulnerability of your ship or squadron by controlling the range. Now, you'll be able to control the range so, so much more effectively if you have a speed advantage. In the early game, speed for Admiral Fisher in the construction of his uh, dreadnought armoured cruisers, as he initially called them, battle cruisers as they became known, was such an important characteristic that he was willing to compromise the armor scheme, the protection scheme for those ships. When you're controlling the range and your ability to engage and disengage and avoid torpedoes uh, or just leave the battle scene if it's all going badly, I want you to think, or I'd strongly encourage you to think, about three sets of zones. I've called them the primary penetration armor zone. So at what point do your guns start to penetrate the enemy's armor, the enemy's main armor in particular. Your secondary penetration armor zone. So at what point do your secondary guns start to penetrate the secondary armor of your enemy? And by me and by secondary armor, I mean um, belt extender, deck extender, armor for secondary armament, that kind of thing. Not the primary belt or the main armament, um, belt, uh, protection or the conning tower. And then thirdly, so these two are your ability to damage the enemy. And then thirdly, your vulnerability to being damaged itself, what's known as the immunity zone. At what distance are you immune from, classically, your own guns? Immunity zone is a, is a helpful design uh, calculation when you're balancing up a ship how big should your guns be how heavy should your protection be well if your protection can give you immunity from your own guns that seems like a well-balanced ship if your armament easily overpowers your own protection then that's an imbalanced ship yeah i'm looking at you glorious courageous and uh, formidable <laughs> Large, light cruisers, indeed. Um, so thinking about it in this way brings up, uh, let me just turn the spotlight off, brings up this kind of thought. So here we are. Here is our enemy. And here is the range in between. And at what point can our guns penetrate the enemy's armor? At what point are we immune from the enemy's guns? At what point does our secondary armament start to uh, penetrate their own? Now, you can't know this exactly. And just because you are not able to penetrate or they are not able to penetrate does not mean they can't penetrate. There are flukes, there's luck, there's all sorts of stuff going on in the calculations. It's not a perfect zero-sum game either. Yes, they can. No, they can't. 
we're working with probabilities here. You will need to understand gun penetration. Not obsessively, but at least you'll have to, uh, well, you'll have to. It would be wise if you kept an eye on how gun penetration is doing. How can you do that? Well, for yourself, it's easy. You just go to your ship details and up brings up that lovely dialog box with loads of stats and a few buttons. And one of the first buttons is to look at the data for your gun, which will bring up the armor penetration. So that's easy enough. You can always tell your own penetration values. And likewise, you can look at the penetration values for your secondary armament too, in the same location. When it comes to your enemy's gun performance, you'll have to be a little bit more creative. You can, of course, just infer. I have 12 inch guns, they have 12 inch guns, their performance is likely to be the same or very similar. Um, so I can just take that as red. Or it can be a little bit heuristic, a rule of thumb. I have 12 inch guns, they have 13 inch guns, my performance is X, so let's guess that their performance is Y. However, if you want to be a little bit more certain of this, you have to do a little bit of pre-war intelligence gathering. Now you can partly do that by good old-fashioned uh, intelligence works, setting your intelligence levels to high against your most likely opponent, and being able to find out what research they've been able to do, and that includes the performance of their guns. Or you could be a bit more sneaky. You could uh, design a ship, a ship you don't intend to build, go to a foreign yard, and see what guns they offer, and they will tell you what penetration they will get. This is super useful for assessing the performance of guns you haven't researched yet, but your potential enemy has. Now, there is a limit to this slight sneakiness, which is that if tensions are high between you, say your Germany, and your tensions are high with Russia, you won't be able to go and pretend to build a ship in a Russian shipyard to find out what Russian guns are like. However, if you know that the Russians have, for the sake of argument, developed a 14-inch gun, and you haven't, you will be able to go to a friendlier nation and design a ship there and look at their 14-inch guns and take a reasonable assumption that the Russian 14-inch guns are going to be similar in performance. So it takes a certain little bit of deliberate thought, but if you are uh, undergunned in comparison to your enemy, and obviously that's very true of Germany to, to begin with, where it only starts with 11-inch guns and the rest of the world has 12-inch guns, then that's a nice way of finding out what the immunity zone is going to look like when you're facing bigger gun ships. So try and stay within the penetration zone of your guns. And particularly in the pre-Dreadnought era, when your secondary guns are so important to overwhelming an enemy ship, try and get within your secondary gun penetration zone of their secondary armor. And try and avoid compromising your own immunity zone. Obviously, you can see here in this diagram, we do outperform the enemy in guns, so we can get within this range and still penetrate their primary armor with our primary guns, but we're short on the secondary armor. So if we wanted, if these were pre-dreadnoughts and we wanted to really close the range to be effective, we would have to compromise our immunity zone and allow the enemy's main guns to have the opportunity to penetrate our own. I hope that all makes sense uh, and isn't a little bit too much. If it is, just go back to the first thought, which is control the range. Think about it very deliberately. What is it like to be at 15,000 or 10,000 or 5,000 uh, yards and 
decide what kind of range do you want to be at initially. If you can couple that with the kinds of hit chance that you've got, if you know that at 10,000 yards you're looking at a hit chance of, say, 2, and you close that to 7,500, and it goes up to 4, and then at 5,000 yards it goes up to 10, well, then you can make really informed decisions about how you want to control the range. Right. That's controlling the range all at once. Now we're going to break down some tactics for shooting better uh, one by one. So first of all, for torpedo attacks and for air attacks and for missile attacks, in many ways you can think of torpedoes and missiles as functionally equivalent. I mean, yes, one goes underwater and one flies through the air, but they are sort of the same. Torpedoes are sort of slow underwater missiles, not powered by rockets, but they have that same volley characteristic. You shoot them once and then they're done. So one tactic that you can do is what uh, Norman Friedman, in his various books on the First World War and on firepower, has described as browning shots, which is a slightly unpleasant sounding term, where borrowed from the infantry, you see a mass of infantry coming along, you don't point your rifle at an individual target, you just point at the mass of brown uniforms in the expectation that it's probably going to hit something somewhere. Now, as it happens, browning shots didn't really take place, certainly uh, not in the First World War in any meaningful way, because destroyer commanders knew they only had one chance of loosing off their torpedoes, and they really wanted to make them count. So they very much did pick a deliberate target, rather than just firing the whole mass off at the battle line. However, as a tactic, it totally makes sense to loose off a whole load of torpedoes in a mass attack, and if you can make that mass attack at multiple angles, so it's hard for anyone to turn away, so much the better. So this is a battle from 1906. We have the Royal Navy battle fleet over here. We have the Royal Navy's armored cruiser fast wing over here. Uh, there's another one up there. Uh, there's some light cruisers down here, some light cruisers and destroyers down there. And in the middle is the disorganized American battle line and a bit more over here and various uh, sunk transports and cruisers and what have you. Uh, the scenario was that the Americans were trying to escort an invasion convoy and it hasn't gone well for them. And at this point in the battle, where they are functionally surrounded, would be a wonderful uh, opportunity to fire torpedoes at multiple vectors that would make it very difficult for the Americans to turn away in any meaningful sense. However, this is 1906, and the torpedoes aren't up to the performance, but I thought it was a lovely example of a position where that could have been an interesting tactic were your torpedoes longer range. Next, engage the enemy more closely. Famous signal from Nelson just before his battle lines started to engage the French-Spanish fleet at Trafalgar. You can do no harm by getting closer to your enemy. Yes, your own risks to yourself do increase. You are likely to be hit and hit more often, but equally you are more likely to hit and do greater damage as a consequence. So getting close is a tipping point decision. I mean, it was easy for Nelson. The, the range of broadside here was just one or two hundred yards. So he could sail his two columns for ages and ages and ages and not be in range of the uh, Franco-Spanish fleet. And only at the last few moments, as they were intersecting the line, did they start to take fire. Have a think. When is the time to get stuck in, get close, and really make telling hits. Next, chasing. I recommend that if you are chasing your enemy, or indeed if you are being chased, and you have a squadron of vessels, get them to go into line abreast. If you chase in line ahead, the likelihood is that your front ship 
will strongly interfere with the firing of your rear ship. You will suffer a, potentially a number of gunnery negative modifiers. Smoke is probably going to be a problem. Fouling the range is probably going to be a problem. Your ship is interfering with, the first ship is interfering with the range finders of the ship behind. There's also probably one for multiple ships firing at the same target. If you get into line abreast, you should be able to open up the firing arc, possibly of some of the rear guns, but certainly of the front guns, and make shooting more effective, make it more possible for the second ship not to shoot at this ship, but to sh shoot at a ship in advance of that. And of course, if you're being chased instead, the opposite is all true. Avoid maximum speed. In the coal era, your poor stokers who are shoveling in coal, um, working so, so hard in appalling hot conditions, they will get exhausted and your speed, your maximum speed, will slowly start to decline. Equally, your grates will get sooted up and that will slow down your speed. Better to go at a speed two knots underneath your maximum speed in order to pace your stokers and pace the rate at which your grates get fouled. If you don't have coal-based ships, you will suffer from excessive vibration and obviously you'll suffer this with coal as well. So at full speed, the ship is hammering through the waves and the engines are cranked up to maximum and the whole ship will shudder as a consequence, which will put off the delicate optical uh, range finding gear and just make it really hard to you know, look through telescopes and things like that to find uh, and get carry on shooting at your enemy. I mean, obviously there are times when maximum speed is absolutely necessary and get stuck in, but for sustained shooting, if you can, come off your maximum speed by a couple of knots. Tactic number 20 sail straight to shoot straight. It hardly should need saying really, because when you think about it, it's obvious. If you zigzag, if you twist and turn, you are going to not only spoil your enemy's shooting, but you're going to spoil your own shooting. The mathematical calculations of where I am, where the enemy is, what bearing they're going, what speed they're going, how they're turning, how we're turning, what the rate of change of the range is, you know, is it going up very, very quickly from 10,000, 10,100, 10,200, or is it closing very, very quickly, or is it nice and steady? These are all important considerations for how likely you are to hit your enemy. And if you don't sail in a nice straight line, you will spoil your gun aiming. I mean, on the plus side, you'll also spoil your enemy's gun aiming too. If you turn one point, 11 and a quarter degrees, that's going to impose a small penalty on your firing accuracy. If you turn two points, 22 and a half degrees, that's going to impose a substantial uh, penalty on your shooting. Here, at 45 degrees, four point turn, you put a minus 80 modifier, a whopping modifier. I mean, it's really going to spoil your aim until you've stopped turning. You will also probably suffer from fewer of your guns being able to fire, uh, because they're not on the broadside anymore. And you'll also suffer the penalty that the target's aspect has changed. So if the target is broadside to you, there's no modifier. But if the target is at a fine angle, there's a, a negative modifier. And if it's beam on, there's an even bigger modifier. Plus, if you do these radical turns, you will lose speed. Of course, you may have to do this. You may have to make a sudden turn, you know, Hello, turning away from a torpedo attack or threatened torpedo attack, and that's absolutely fine, but do so in the knowledge that it will ruin your gunnery. Uh, next, a really old-fashioned one, take the wind gauge. Be aware of where the wind is blowing and where that therefore means the smoke will interfere. So you can see the wind direction is here. Here we have a protected cruiser, the uh, Prince Adalbert. It's smoke is coming out and then being blown down like this uh, because of the wind. So if I was to shoot in that direction, it would interfere with my gunnery and potentially quite a severe modifier would be applied. Better to pick a course 
that allows the enemy's smoke to interfere with the enemy's gunnery. That's a great thing to do. Next is Torpedo from your bow quarter. Anyone who's seen some of my um, Let's Play series, Let's Play with a Very Small Navy with Germany, noticed some terrible, terrible German um, tactics of having the destroyers chase the enemy battle fleet. So they only had a closing speed of a few knots, like five or six, and took a terrible punishment as a consequence. Don't do that. Approach from ahead. So here we've got the enemy. Here we've got our destroyers rushing in. If the enemy is coming in at, say, 25 knots, and we are coming in at 25 knots, we have a combined approach speed of 50 knots. That's really difficult for enemy gunnery to shoot at because the rate of change is enormous, certainly compared to chasing from behind at five knots. So you're using speed very much as protection here. You then turn to bring your torpedo firing arcs open, launch your torpedoes, and then make your escape. The actual escape direction depends very much on what the enemy does. So if the enemy was just to plow on in this circumstance, then turning away would probably be best. Although if they're turning at 25 knots and you're going at 25 knots, you're not going to run away very quickly. You might actually be better to quickly run down the side. At least then you are still crisscrossing uh, at a high speed from each other. If the enemy's turned away, spotting that torpedoes are coming, then this escape route totally makes sense. Here's a, a real-life example of that. So we have uh, an English uh, destroyer squadron who've rushed up. Here they are in position two, opening up their arcs. So we have the Eden here and the Boyne just behind. The Eden has uh, got the Brooklyn class armoured cruiser at 1,100 yards. Because the Brooklyn is closing, we've got a high speed shot at it. Hooray! The Eden had a similar one, and they were both able to fire at the Brooklyn. And it being, I think this was 1903, and everything being a bit wonky, uh, they missed. But it doesn't matter. It was a great firing position, and that's exactly the way to do it. Tactic 23, the last one in our Shooting Butter series, is to sacrifice your destroyers in torpedo attacks. I suppose I should say when you're firing against capital ships, or at least a high value ship. So the cost of a destroyer in 1900 is only 1 35th of the cost of a battleship. So something like 1,700 pounds or marks, or lira, or rubles, or dollars, uh, against the cost of a battleship. So 1,700 against, say, 50 to 60,000 for a battleship. By 1955, a destroyer is worth about 1 12th, because destroyers have become 2,500 tons, not just 500 ton little tin cans. Nonetheless, still potentially worth a good sacrifice. So here we've got uh, the Blackwater leading a squadron of uh, destroyers from behind in a way that I'd said, don't do, don't do this, and taking punishment and is probably going to sink. The Brooklyn, however, may well suffer if the rest of the squadron is able to haul up parallel to it and open up its firing arcs and sink it. In that case, the loss of the Blackwater will have been well worth it. So that's it for this second study, all about controlling the range and thinking about ways of shooting your guns and shooting your torpedoes more effectively. Next up in study number three will be thoughts about maneuvering your entire fleet to gain tactical advantage on the battlefield. I hope you found this helpful and interesting. Uh, please give it a like simply because it just tells YouTube that you thought it was interesting and that therefore other people might find it interesting. Stay well, stay safe, and see you for part three. Bye for now.